this august body and immediately apologize for lowering the tone by beginning with a reference to that seminal text for the study of medieval urban health, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Can I just Some of you will be familiar with the celebrated scene in which King Arthur rides with his coconut shells through what is described in the script as a wretched, impoverished, plague-ridden township where dead donkeys and cats lie half buried in a sea of filth and a cart piled high with human bodies trundles through the mud. As Arthur passes by, one resident assures another that he must be a king because he's the only person not covered in excrement. Um, I'm sanitizing the script here for the benefit of the sensitive. From the searing intensity of Ingmar Bergman's Seventh Seal, which of course this is sending up, to the surreal humor of the Pythons, the cinematic Middle Ages are all too often emerge smeared with filth and littered with garbage. And it's not just on the silver screen. Popular history is exemplified in the fairly recent TV series, Filthy Cities, a title which speaks for itself, presents a truly dismal picture of medieval urban life that's hardly changed since the scholars and sanitary campaigners of Victorian England first addressed the topic. A representative example of their views may be found in The Coming of the Friars, a book of essays composed in 1890 for the popular market by the antiquary Augustus Jessup. Actually, 1889. He observed, and you can read the text yourself, that the sediment of the town population in the Middle Ages was a dense slough of stagnant misery, squalor, famine, loathsome disease, and dull despair, such as the worst slums of London, Liverpool, or Paris knew nothing of. What greatly added to the dreary wretchedness of the lower order in the towns was the fact that ever-increasing throngs of beggars, outlaws, and runaway ruffians were simply left to fend for themselves. The civil authorities took no account of them as they quietly rotted and died. Six years later, in 1895, the eminent physician, Sir George Newman, cited this very passage as evidence of the feculent conditions in which leprosy was bound to flourish, adding further embellishments of his own about the grim business of survival in a society, and I'm quoting here, which knew little of decency, cleanliness, and order, and was notable for its total neglect of all hygienic or sanitary laws. Now, I've quoted these remarks before in papers that I've given on this topic and make no apology for doing so again since the assumption that late medieval men and women remained indifferent to matters of public health. The plague, 38, simply will not die. Indeed, a belief that English magistrates in particular were completely supine in the face of epidemic disease and that their only response lay in prayer and penitence, still lingers on today, even in academic circles. For example, um, Professor Oli Benedicto has recently argued that the dramatic shift from a high-pressure to a low-pressure model of human population across northern Europe during the mid-16th century can be explained in terms of the first stirrings of medical and sanitary progress. In other words, numbers began to rise as pragmatism triumphed over superstition. And he writes, it's evident that a key factor in this transition was the great change in the understanding of infectious diseases, which began at the end of the 15th century or perhaps slightly later. Please bear those dates in mind. Now, instead of simply being fatalistically comprehended as a divine punishment for human sin, communicable disease began to be seen as a natural phenomenon, one that could be prevented, limited, or halted by human countermeasures, even though the transmission of diseases was still understood in terms of the classical notion of miasma. That's corrupt air. 
Now, this attitude seems especially surprising in view of the fact that from the 1920s onwards, scholars who'd worked closely on medieval records began seriously to question these Victorian assumptions. It was in 1928 that the author of a magisterial um, history of medieval science, Lynn Thorndike, issued his memorable appeal in the journal Speculum for less mudslinging and more facts, which is the title of part of my title tonight, where pre-modern public health was concerned. And his revisionist agenda was taken up in the following decade by E.L. Sobine with a trio of important articles, again in Speculum, that cast medieval London in a very different and much cleaner light. Adopted in specific times and cities, such as London, Hull, Salisbury, and York, while others have addressed such specific issues as the provision of water and the condition of the streets. What's now needed, I think, is a more interdisciplinary and integrated approach to these findings, which brings together archaeological and environmental and historical sources in the context of late medieval medical and religious beliefs. These in turn need to be understood from a contemporary perspective, that is a medieval perspective, free from the condescension of posterity. I hope to demonstrate the value of this approach today by focusing on Norwich, which is unusually blessed with source material and which also helps us to understand why the ideas advanced by Augustus Jessup, and uh, here he is, and his associates have proved so very tenacious. That these men should have formed such a negative view of the Middle Ages is entirely understandable. They were, after all, products of the culture which basked, and I'm quoting, in the revealing light of science, and tended as a result to disparage those unfortunates who, in Jessup's words, aforetime walked in darkness. We should also remember that Jessup was a Norwich man, and that his judgment as an historian was clearly overshadowed by his own personal experience of the devastating impact of the Industrial Revolution upon one of the economic backwaters of Victorian England. It's surely no coincidence that the Norwich of his youth ranked as one of the most insanitary provincial cities in England, with an infant mortality rate slightly higher than those of Manchester, Leeds and Liverpool, but with none of their prosperity. It was, in the words of one observer, in that painful state of transition from a once flourishing manufacturing prosperity to entire decline, a decline marked by poverty, deprivation, and neglect. Dysentery was endemic, cholera and smallpox rife, prompting one of today's leading demographers to describe Victorian Norwich, and I'm quoting, as a hotbed of squalor, disease, and premature mortality. And here is a rather sunny um, of that particularly dismal area of the city on the banks of the river um, Wensum. Um, and the desperate state of the slum housing in this area was vividly described in 1849 during a campaign for sanitary reform mounted by the Morning Chronicle. Neglect and decay are now conspicuous in the streets and quarters occupied by the working classes, it reported. The poor lived in the twilight of narrow, filthy alleys, closed yards and dilapidated buildings whose conditions were cramped and unhygienic. As in Mayhew's London, it was, and I'm quoting, next to impossible for a person not born in the place to navigate this murky, miasmatic underworld. And here, again, sort of slightly cleaned up, this is a later version, is what the housing was like. The ghettos were called holes, and in words that were replicated verbatim by Jessup in a medieval context, the author noted that Many are to be found in the lower parts of the city, abutting on the river where the ground is constantly damp and moist, where heaps of filth and garbage, open bins and privies, decaying vegetable and other matters are constantly contaminating by their offensive malaria, the unwholesome atmosphere in which the wretched inhabitants live. So 
Despite the many approving references to its clean, well-paved streets, sophisticated water supply, and fresh air made by 17th century visitors, there was a growing consensus on the part of the Victorians that Norwich must always have been filthy. And, um, and uh, that's the quotation from the Morning Chronicle, which gives us such a, a grim picture. And those words are transposed back by Jessup into the Middle Ages. Um, this, I, I, I love, this is the Cunningham's map. He was a physician showing a very healthy medieval city um, according to Hippocratic ideas of health, facing westwards with wonderfully fresh breezes. And you can note it's depicted as clean, healthy environment, um, quite the antithesis of what Jessup describes. The pres presumption of squalor, though, was reinforced by an excoriating report of 1851 commissioned by the Board of Health on the infamously bad sanitary conditions which still blighted the city. William Lee, um, yeah, the superintending uh, inspector, was horrified by many things, but saved his most withering condemnation for the water supply, which he pronounced very bad and very defective, bad in quantity, bad in quality, and bad in everything that should constitute a water supply. And this was partly due to the fact that sanitary provision was even worse. In Lee's uncompromising words, the city upon the whole would be about as well off or better without any drainage at all. But as a good Victorian progressive, Lee was determined to prove some or provide a sense of context and began with a graphic account of the ravages of disease in former times, which had been, of course, much, much worse and to have been occasioned by even higher levels of urban squalor. And he rammed home the point by citing grossly inflated mortality figures of 57,374, besides religious and beggars, sustained in Norwich during the first months of the Black Death, which he misdated. And so, in light of these statistics and his terrible report, you can see why Jessup takes the tone he does when describing Norwich in the 13th century. The actual death rate during the Black Death is impossible to establish, but it was clearly far lower than Lee's estimate. Norwich's population slumped from around 25,000 in the 1330s to fewer than 8,000 in the 1370s. That's during the period which saw the first three major outbreaks of plague in East Anglia. Other factors besides disease explain this dramatic fall, but it's clear that pestilence still cut a swathe through the populace. But was the city really in as bad a state as Lee believed? Elizabeth Rutledge has documented high levels of overcrowding among the immigrant day laborers who flooded into Norwich looking for work in the aftermath of the early 14th century famines. Their living conditions were often cramped and dirty, constituting in which infectious diseases such as TB, typhus, malaria, and even leprosy could spread. But we should be wary of assuming that the entire city was submerged under a sea of filth, or that the ruling elite was indifferent to the need for sanitary regulation. Not surprisingly, the Black Death gave rise to a significant amount of economic and social dislocation, prompting the Crown to write harshly in 1351 to Norwich's magistrates, ordering them to put the unemployed to work cleaning the streets, which had been rendered hazardous by piles of filth and broken paving. Similar letters were dispatched to the citizens of London, in both cases drawing attention to the fact that, under normal circumstances, thoroughfares were kept admirably clear of garbage and that acceptable standards of hygiene had maintained, been maintained. Three years later, the Norwich authorities themselves took steps to, address, to deal with the unacceptable number of stray dogs and swine roaming at large. This, too, was a public health measure occasioned by the dramatic consequences of sudden mortality and again underscores the fact that normal patterns of life 
had dramatically broken down. And note the streets were already paved. Although it staged an economic revival, thanks to a well-timed shift into cloth production, and was thus considerably better off than most late medieval English cities, Norwich couldn't escape the ongoing ravages of epidemic disease and continued to suffer repeatedly from both local and national outbreaks of pestilence until the 17th century. And these outbreaks are reflected in the city's art. Here, the one surviving panel from a set of panels of stained glass in St. Andrew's Church depicting the dance of death. Death here seizes a bishop, which was considered suitable to survive the Reformation. The rest were destroyed, uh, underscoring the presence of death in the city. And this wonderful painting of, John Jan of Robert Janis, uh, alderman of Norwich, which is taken from a stained glass window in the Guildhall, now lost, again with death. Um, and the point to bear in mind is underneath the glass originally was a set of verses pointing out that if you wish to seek a memorial like Janus, you must invest in public works. Because, as we shall see, the repeated experience of pestilence had a significant impact upon levels of sanitary provision and anxiety about health hazards, which increased exponentially after every outbreak. It is, however, important to stress that much of the groundwork had already been laid, not least by the Franciscans, about whose living conditions Jessup had been so gloomy. And um, here we have a map of the water system of Norwich, and the Franciscan friary is just here. Being a new convert to technology, I tend to go rather mad with the arrows, but... Um, this, 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 the Franciscan friar is here. Whoops, sorry. Let's go back. And um, on a, a cocky or stream um, going into the River Wensum. Here's the River Wensum going round the city. The friar's initial home was indeed rather marshy, but a recently published excavation report by the Norfolk Archaeology Unit on the permanent site to which they soon repaired has revealed an extremely sophisticated scheme of water management. This is clearly planned as part, an integral part, of the claustral layout and included no fewer than 11 wells, a network of lead and ceramic piping, and an impressive system of brick and flint-lined underground drains, the cheap of which ran into this Dallingfleet stream and into the river. And I'm very grateful to Mr. Brian Ayres for this slide. Thank you, Brian. The sewerage system, uh, and uh, the system was clean. There was no, no deposits when it was excavated. The system was constructed um, to allow regular flushing with clean piped water to prevent blockages or the deposit of offensive matter. And uh, this is a partial reconstruction of the water system with wells, settling tanks and machinery for flushing out this, gray, this drain to avoid the build-up of miasmatic airs which were believed to spread disease. The Grey Friars were not unusual in this regard. Informed by the growing corpus of literature which occupied a prominent place in their libraries, religious houses throughout the city and indeed throughout England invested heavily in the construction of sewers designed to prevent these dangerous accumulations of waste while ensuring a regular supply of fresh water. Excavation has also disclosed part of a massive medieval drain serving the, the latrines of the infirmary at the Benedictine Priory, just north of the Franciscans. It was made, as you can see here, of flint and mortar, almost a metre thick, with a barrel vault over two metres high, arched in Khan stone. The entire drainage system, at least part of which dated back to the 12th century, may have extended for as far as 500 metres, so that again it could flow into the river. And even again to the north of the cathedral, uh, this map is not to scale, um, the little hospital of St. Giles in the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the north on the bend of the River Wensum had from the 1270s onwards piped water, partly because the marshy site was unsuitable for sinking wells. <laughs> 
but not all improvements were ecclesiastical. Significantly, in his lengthy catalogue of Norwich's 19th century shortcomings, Lee drew particular attention to the absence of any public measures for the removal of refuse or the repair of the rudimentary sewerage system, to the accumulation of stagnant waste in open drains, and to the proliferation of noisome slaughterhouses, resulting in the sale of contaminated meat. A very relevant topic. Yet all of these abuses had been subject to stringent regulation before the Black Death. And it's upon these specific issues that I propose to concentrate in the rest of this talk. Um, these are patterns of zoning in um, early 14th century, late 13th century Norwich. And if we focus for a moment upon the slaughterhouses and the butchers, we can see that they're all relegated to a ridge to the south of the city. And uh, this illustrates, I think, that this zoning patterns, how much care was taken to avoid pollution. On this high ground, there was plenty of grazing land, easy access to the river for waste disposal, downstream of more densely populated areas, and a strong breeze to dispel the miasmatic air which was believed to spread plague. And this rather delightful early 18th century engraving shows you, this is the, looking at Norwich from the north, there's the great hospital, there's the cathedral, that would have been the friary, and there's the best, there's the ridge, where the butchers were situated, and they dumped their waste into the river here. Of course, it went down the river to Brundle, but they weren't concerned about the people who lived in Brundle. And um, I think it is important, this is an Italian image, to um, point out here that butchery was something which really concentrated the minds of urban authorities in the Middle Ages throughout Europe, because it's seen as a particular source of miasmatic air. And, and one of the things authorities are particularly keen to do is to prevent butchering in inner cities where meat is actually being sold. So... Just like the Victorians, late medieval men and women were convinced that epidemic disease was spread by contaminated air, and notably that arising from butchery, dung heaps, overflowing privies, rubbish tips, stagnant water, and other sources of urban pollution. And just like the Victorians, they took active steps to eliminate these hazards to the best of their ability, based upon the Hippocratic principles of air, water, and situation. Um, these texts were known and understood in the Middle Ages. That Norwich might ever have been cleaner, or that the corporation might once have played a more dynamic role in the struggle to protect the health of its inhabitants, nonetheless seemed unimaginable to right-thinking Victorian sanitarians who still today cast such a long shadow over writing about urban standards of living. And it's not just the Victorians who have influenced our attitudes to public health in medieval England. Although, as Derek Keane has observed, English writers were from the 12th century onwards avidly extolling the virtues of their native towns and cities, Italians, such as Leonardo Bruni, have effectively stolen the show. His panegyric to the unique virtues of Florence, composed in 1402, finds its way into most histories of the Renaissance. It seems to me, it looks pretty cramped to me, but it seems to me that Florence is so clean and neat that no other city could be cleaner, he boasted in a celebrated passage which has until recently been taken at face value. Um, the challenge more recently by Professor John Henderson, who's here tonight. The assumption that England lagged centuries behind Italy with regard to the introduction of sanitary legislation has become an entrenched orthodoxy, reinforced by a conviction that from 1348 onwards, English urban communities remained supine and helpless in the face of plague. In their survey of environmental law in medieval Italy, Zucco and Lores, for example, contrast the measures taken for street cleaning and the elimination of, of nuisances as early as the 13th century in towns such as Bergamo and Bologna, 
with the apparent ignorance and indifference of North European magistrates. Does this unflattering comparison really hold true? Setting aside the fact that Siena did not regulate its butchers to the urban periphery until the 1450s, we can, I think, make a pretty convincing case for the defense. And this case hinges in part upon the nature of late medieval urban custom and of urban record keeping. The fact that English cities did not establish boards of health on the Italian model or keep special books recording sanitary measures does not mean that such measures were not taken. One simply has to search for the evidence in different places. Norwich is earliest surviving leak rolls, which date from 1287, confirm that local courts or ward moots were anxious to name, shame, and punish residents whose behavior posed a hazard to public health. And this shows you the city breakdown into wards, each of which had their own court. And it's here at this level that sanitary cases are investigated, or breaches of sanitary regulation. In that year alone, 1287, at least seven people were accused of obstructing waterways or contaminating them with sewage. And in 1288, 20 more came to notice for the illicit dumping of waste. Repeated references to the great corruption of the air to the endangerment of human life, occasioned by such nuisances, demonstrate a keen awareness of miasma theory long before the first outbreak of plague threw the dangers of stagnant water and noxious odors into such sharp relief. As well as condemning practices which they personally found, jurors who made these presentments were responding to lists of prohibited nuisances compiled by local magistrates and indeed by central government at Westminster. Prominent among the latter was a comprehensive compositio or synthesis of measures concerning the quality and inspection of consumables drawn up in 1275 by Edward I. Inter alia, these ordinances imposed heavy penalties on the vendors of swine's flesh measled, that's leprous, or flesh dead of the marine. It doesn't say anything about horse meat. But, um, and so it's, the, these compositions are keen to regulate the quality of meat being sold in the butcher's stalls and other marketplaces of medieval England, particularly keen on contaminated meat. Between 1287 and 1289, for instance, Norwich courts drew attention to four sellers of infected bacon and two of measly pork. Dealers in the flesh of dead animals, passed off as sound, retailers of unwholesome veal, and all those Sprouston men, Sprouston men always get in trouble, who sold contaminated pork along with dodgy sausages and puddings unfit for human consumption. And they indicted other officials for retailing flesh condemned as unfit, and most of all, the cooks and pie bakers who reheat their wares. They were fined sixpence each. Recalcifactors, people who reheat, it, it's contravening sell by dates, really, um, are, are the bane of magistrates' lives. Many of you will know Chaucer's description of the cook in his fly bone blown premises, you know, with the saw on his leg. And this is a constant theme in um, med medieval uh, sanitary legislation. And I don't know about you, but I would be reluctant to purchase food from those two. Um, it's a sort of greasy spoon, I think, or kebab shop. As time passed and the enormity of such offences became even more apparent, the penalties rose. Members of this audience will, of course, be aware that diet was regarded as the first instrument of medicine during the Middle Ages, and crucially, that the ingestion of substandard food was believed to destabilize the humors, thereby making an individual vulnerable to plague. And here's the science bit. This is a body map of 1292 showing how you ingest food. It's cooked in the stomach, goes to the liver where it's turned into humoral matter, and is then transported through the nerve, uh, sorry, through the um, through the venous system to feed the body. And it's believed that if this food is corrupt, 
then the body will be not only made ill, but also more vulnerable to the miasmas of plague. As one physician writes, fire will only break out where matter is combustible. And this, of course, is well known to urban magistrates. And in extreme cases, there was the generation of disease-bearing miasmas to consider. One of the first measures enacted in Venice when the plague struck in 1348 was for the removal of infected pork, which creates a great stench and attendant putrefaction that corrupts the air. From this date onwards, in Norwich, confiscated meat would be publicly burnt in the middle of the marketplace as a terrible lesson to potential offenders. Um, and it's at this date that Norwich Market is divided into rows where you have the butchers, the fishmongers, and all the other food sellers so they can be more effectively patrolled by the clerks and sergeants of the market, like modern-day food inspectors. And one of their tasks from the 1470s onwards was to ensure that nobody who worked in the local leper hospitals touched the meat that was on sale. It's interesting to note that butchers who were stuffing carcasses with foul cloths and other vile stuff to make them look plumper were not only accused of causing a great increase of diseases, but also besmirching the good name of the city. So just as in Italy, appearances, virtue, and reputation really mattered. And the people who were guilty of these offences were put in the pillory at the Market Cross. And in some instances, they had to inhale the fumes of what's burnt below them. The quality of the water supply was equally important, not just because contaminated water caused sickness, but because flooding, itself a recurrent hazard in medieval towns like Norwich, was directly associated in the period with the stagnant water and pools of rotting debris that, bled, that bred the miasmas of plague. And I've put up for you here an extract from the kind of book that was owned by urban magistrates in the late 15th century. Um, it's Thomas Forestier's Vernacular Manual of 1485 um, on the avoidance of sweating sickness, but it's actually pinched from John of Burgundy's plague tract. And um, it explains that pestilence comes of an open cause, a stinking carrion cast in the water night of cities or towns. And the corruption of privies, of this the water is corrupt. And when his meat is boiled and drink made of this water, many sickness is gendered in man's body. And also of the casting of stinking water and many other foul things in the streets, the air is corrupt. And note the emphasis on smell and the keeping of stinking waters in houses or in kitchens long time. And then in night of those things, vapors are lift up into the air, the which doth infect the substance of the air, by the which substance of the air corrupt and infect men to die suddenly going by the streets or by the way. Of the which things that every man that loves God and his neighbor amend. And note that emphasis on God and his neighbor. And then returning back to the science bit, another body map, these are the arteries. Um, air is inhaled through the nose, mixed with um, arterial blood, um, uh, sorry, um, in the heart and lungs. I'm going backwards, aren't I? Let's go. Um, let's go back in the heart and lungs, and then transported along the arteries. And this corrupt air could have a terrible effect on the natural thermostat of the body, spreading corruption and causing plague. And so there is an underlying scientific rationale for these ideas. Even so, for some historians, nothing illustrates the backwardness of English cities so much as the presumed inadequacies of the water supply. Richard Holt's rather grudging survey of provision in English medieval towns, published in 2000, led him to conclude that urban authorities were indifferent, if not hostile, to the need for improvements. This, he pointed out with some asperity, was in marked contrast to the situation in Italy, which was clearly light years ahead in terms of the extent and sophistication of its supply. The fact that he did not mention about 95% of the available examples, including Exeter's spectacular pipe water system, uh, which runs through these stone-lined um, tunnels, and 
Um, one I really rather do like, King's Lynn. Um, and these show the pipes and conduits available in the early 16th century, um, rather diminishes the force of his argument. In fact, most English towns of any size by this date have got piped water systems. Uh, Norwich is by, uh, King's Lynn, by the way, is reconstructed from the Hall books. Norwich was, in fact, one of the very few English cities that didn't boast a pipe water system being so liberally blessed with fresh water streams that it didn't need to spend much needed resources on pipes until 1582, by which date the population had risen dramatically. And here is the first pump put in by Robert Gibson in 1582, and you can see how dilapidated it had become by the Victorian period. Instead, the, system rely the city relies on wells and this system of cockies, these are the little dotted lines, um, which are the natural streams running through the city. These are um, directed through stone line gutters or culverts, um, and great care was taken to see that these were maintained and the adjoining streets were kept free of garbage and noxious waste. The continuous process of cleaning, scouring, and repairing the cockies and adjacent latrines demanded a remarkable degree of collaboration, some being the responsibility of the municipality and some of neighboring householders. While affluent citizens might undertake to finance specific projects as a charitable work. Yet with a few notable exceptions, which invariably coincided with periods of unrest or epidemics, this system functioned effectively, disproving the wild, widely held view that medieval sanitary measures were inherently unworkable because of their heavy dependence upon individual cooperation. Medieval Norwich had clearly signed up to the big society. It was harder to bridge to the River Wensum, against which the authorities waged a persistent battle. At first, the Leet courts took the lead in presenting offenders who were fined for such unacceptable behavior as stowing carcasses into watercourses, leaving offensive muck heaps, and polluting the river with industrial waste. But naming and shaming at a local level was clearly not enough. In the 1380s, draconian fines of 20 shillings for each offense, along with loss of freedom or expulsion from Norwich, were threatened for any breach of the regulations about dumping although in practice a more realistic but still heavy sum of six and eightpence was the norm. And please bear in mind, this is 20 days' work by a master mason, so it's no small sum. In 1459, in the aftermath of an epidemic, measures were first introduced for the re regular removal of all muck and filth from the river bank by boat. It's a two-ton boat, a two-ton draft, so it's large. Earlier, ad hoc efforts to force all those who live by the river to cleanse it themselves or to pay laborers to do so were thus abandoned in favor of a permanent official s solution that integrated sanitary measures right across the city. By 1468, one official committee focused upon the state of the streets and gutters, while another was specifically concerned with the cleanliness of the river and its environs. It was then decreed by the mayor's court that the city should be repaved at the expense of individual householders in order to facilitate waste removal and drainage. The road surfaces were to be leveled and paved in such a way that the water will fall in future, running down to the lowest part of the street as far as the gutters called the cockies and thence to the river. So they were carefully sloped to facilitate um, the removal of waste. Initiatives of this kind inevitably followed epidemics, which, as we have seen, were attributed with faultless logic to foul air and brackish water. Without much in the way of infrastructure to sustain them, their success depended upon corporate and communal vigilance. Since the commissioners faced a heavy fine of tuppence a day for neglecting their duties, they were nothing if not meticulous, assiduously noting offences such as the keeping of noiseful and very noiseful privies, gutters and drains, the casting up of muck and the diversion of water for industrial purposes. Communal measures 
such as the levying of specific rates to clean the river, and for the weekly removal of waste by cart rather than water, helped further to ameliorate the problems of inner city life. And I can assure you that my waste is now removed once a fortnight, so we have gone backwards. So too, and I think this is wonderful, the decision to make the mayor personally liable to the tune of five pounds for any protracted problems with the river, um, an ingenious stratagem that we might profitably consider worth reviving today. The appointment of a salaried raker and the purchase of two common carts for the avoiding of filthy and vile matter in the early 16th century helped to earn Norwich its growing reputation as an orderly and hygienic city, through whose thoroughfares and waterways, whose thoroughfares and waterways were kept clean by means, and I'm quoting, of diverse good and godly acts and ordinances. According to the mayor and corporation, and they are of course biased, these innovations have not only been a great ease and healthful commodity to the inhabitants, but also a goodly beautifying and an occasion that diverse visitors having access to the city from far and strange places have much commended and praised the same and the magistrates for the maintenance thereof. And here is one of the magistrates, Robert Gardner, who died in 1508, mayor of this most comely city, Huius Civitatis Commodissime, who helped to pay for the new cross and the gutters. Gardner belonged to a long line of wealthy philanthropists who sank their money into schemes for communal health and the amelioration of the city for spiritual as well as pragmatic reasons. And this is why I stressed religion at the start of my lecture. Significantly, after the Black Death, investment in public utilities was increasingly regarded as an extension of the seven comfortable works and therefore of benefit to the donor's immortal soul as well as the physical health George Osborne's problems would be solved in an instant if we could bring back the doctrine of purgatory, as the threat of fire and brimstone is far greater inducement to charitable giving than a few pounds in tax relief. And we can see here how almsgiving, whoops, sorry, I'm always doing this, aren't I? Let's go back. Um, the giving of alms here, and here in masses, but the giving of alms means that you are wenched up from purgatory towards heaven, which is a wonderful concept, isn't it? <laughs> the list of charitable donations made by Norwich testators is a very long one, and I'm going to conclude by giving just a few examples to di disprove the impression that it's just pious window dressing and to show how these works tie in, how these gifts tie in with the comfortable works depicted here, which Christ enjoined his followers to perform in order to achieve salvation. John Gilbert, mayor of Norwich in 1519, took a broad view of compassion for the thirsty, giving drink to the thirsty, by instructing his executors to spend 50 pounds on scheme for removing muck and filth from the River Wensum, which was a source of drinking water for some. From Alder, Alderman Ralph Segrim came no less than £133 for a similar purpose. Thomas Aldrich, another member of the Aldermanic bench, left £40 for the sick poor of the city, that was to feed them, giving them bread, and an identical sum to clean up the streets. Elizabeth Thorsby kept the muck cart going with a donation of £10, and it's listed next to a gift to the nuns of Carrow, which I think is very interesting. Alderman Thomas Hemming presented the corporation with two acres of land outside St. Giles's Gate for the disposal of rubbish, while Edmund Wood bequeathed £100 for street cleaning after the manner of London. They, they like to model themselves on London. And there's a sense here that these works are continuing the seven basic works described by Christ and will lead to the salvation of the donor. And at the same time, members of the civic elite were expected to contribute personally to relief funds during times of hardship when grain was scarce. In the 1520s, for instance, every alderman voluntarily donated 
20 combs of wheat to serve the people. And this is during a period of famine. And although London didn't, uh, Norwich didn't have a granary like London's Leadenhall until the 1530s, from the early 14th century, provision was made for the purchase of emergency grain supplies and the sale of subsidized bread to the populace during food shortages, again, giving bread. Initiatives of this kind were a matter of civic pride and economic necessity, as well as public health and Christian compassion. Fear of bread riots and popular unrest was clearly a powerful motive underscoring these open-handed measures. We should also bear in mind that Norwich's prosperity depended upon the trade that conveyed goods to and from its outport at Yarmouth. And in this respect, the Wensum functioned as a venous system for the nourishment of the commercial organs. And like any venous system, it needed regular phlebotomy to remain healthy. By the same token, the tanners, lime burners, smiths, dyers, fullers, and practitioners of other noxious trades might be compared to the less exalted parts of the human body, and might perform an embarrassing function, but was still essential for survival. Yet there was clearly a toll to pay, and by the beginning of the 16th century, the authorities were moving towards what we would call an environmental tax, so that all such great noyers of the same river be further charged than any other persons shall be, when rates were levied for cleaning the Wensum. Norwich's outstanding medieval and early modern archives and archaeological findings furnish a plethora of similar examples which suggest that once they exceeded acceptive levels, insanitary behaviour and endemic pollution were regarded as both dangerous and antisocial, as well as unchristian. Far from being tolerated as an inevitable feature of urban life, they were clearly defined as nuisances to be eliminated by a combination of in and communal action. Lacking the technological expertise and scientific knowledge that we today take for granted, their efforts were inevitably circumscribed and didn't always work. But I think that we can nonetheless agree that the march of sanitary progress from a time of darkness to the golden age of bacteriology as the chapter headings of one early 20th century medical textbook suppose, may well have followed a less direct but much more interesting route. Thank you.